praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So thankful. God is so wonderful. Amen. Amen. So wonderful. You know, uh, it's been a, a bit of a journey that we're taking, and uh, last week was just a just a wonderful, wonderful week. I, I'd really encourage you if you haven't got a chance to check out that message on transitions. I think it would really help you. Uh, just understanding, you know, the dynamics that are going on with transition. We don't always see it. We don't, you know, when we're in the middle of stuff, sometimes we don't always see how it's taking place or how it's going to unfold. But I guarantee you, if you've been living for Jesus for any period of time, you've probably seen God work in your life. Amen. (laughs) You probably can look back and see how he's untangled some messes, right? And, uh, Sometimes our lives, like a, I had it put to me this way recently, like a ball of yarn, okay? And uh, it's like we look at it and we're just like, how do you untangle that thing? But the Lord has a way of revealing to us where to pull the thread, okay? And he can untangle that whole thing. And I'm encouraged with that. But I will tell you, as we've journeyed together, and as we do journey together moving forward, um, we need to remember that God is faithful, He is very faithful, and I believe that he's bringing us to a place where we can embrace the new season, if you will, that he's bringing us into, and he's bringing our way. I believe that every time when God brings us into a new season, it's for a purpose, and whether we fully understand it or not, because sometimes we don't always understand. Sometimes we freak out in the middle of stuff, right? And Because and, we're, we're thinking with the natural, we see with the natural, and we don't deny that, but God is a God not just of the natural, but of the supernatural, amen? And he operates in ways that we don't always see. But I will tell you that God has us. Amen? Can we say that together? God has us. Amen? God loves us. And He will provide for us through whatever transition you are making in your life or I'm making in my life. Okay? And it doesn't matter what season you're in, God is with you. So last week, we saw a couple of things. We were looking at it through the lens of John. Okay? Now, John was also writing about John the Baptist, and we saw the things that were taking place in John the Baptist's life. One of the main things that we came away with is understanding this area of transition is inevitable. You can't run from it, right? It's like that old saying, you can run, but you can't hide, right? I think that's from Viper, from, you know, Top Gun or something like that. But transitions are inevitable. Transitions are something that you and I are going to have to navigate in life. And during transitions, we need to have an anchor, and we understand that to be God's Word, okay? God's Word is the standard that protects us and provides for us, and it's the one thing that stands the test of time. Now, culture is constantly trying to change, right? Culture is trying to influence the church and tell the church what it can and can't do. And unfortunately, there's a lot of churches that are moving away from the standard of God's Word, and they're trying to change truth. But you can't change truth. You can't change God because he's the, yes, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? Amen? So God's word is the standard and the truth in transition. And then even in transition, we saw how John, you know, the great John the Baptist, even he had times of doubt. Even he had times where he, he, he just needed some reassurance. And we too have a place to run to just like John did. You know, he sent his disciples off to Jesus and they came back with an encouraging word to him. And when we have doubts, we can run to Jesus. And Jesus, oftentimes, when we bring him our doubts, when we give, bring him our questions, amen? Or maybe we even bring a time where we made a wrong choice. Anybody ever made a wrong choice? <laughs> I think we all have, right? But even when we make a wrong choice, God has a way of helping us course correct and get back to where we need to go, amen? So we have a place to run. So at the end of the message, I shared something that was kind of an impression that had been on my heart. It had been building in my heart for months. And that we were coming 
towards the end of one season and entering into another. And I don't know how that all is going to unfold, and I'm not trying to, you know, super spiritualize it or anything like that. But it's an impression I've had in my heart, and sometimes when the Holy Spirit speaks to me, it just keeps coming back and coming back. And that impression was that the season of the forerunner, John was the forerunner. Prepare you the way of the Lord. You know, make straight paths for the Lord. Those were the things that he was saying. And John had to transition from that prepare you the way to the Lord to the behold moment when Jesus showed up on the banks of the Jordan and he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So as we are transitioning and praying that God would reveal to us maybe what that would look like, As we approach this, I pray that we can all be intentional, okay? I pray that we can be intentional about praying and seeking and hearing God's voice. Holy Spirit, speak to us. Following the Lord's leading, amen? I don't know about you, but I'm tired of having just the leading of mere man's opinion. We need God's word in the moment, amen? So as we approach this, let's be intentional about hearing God's voice, following his leading, and then the tough part, right? Surrendering in humility and yielding and giving God the right of way in our lives. I understand that there's transitions that take place that are man-initiated and God-initiated. I think we want to avoid the ones that are man-initiated, but we certainly want to embrace the ones that are God-initiated. Because God-initiated transitions, as I mentioned just a, a few seconds ago, always have a divine purpose. God-initiated transitions have a purpose, and it's to provide for something greater in our lives, okay? The Scriptures teach us that we go from glory to glory, okay? And it's not for ourselves, it's for the Lord, And what we remember in transitions is that maybe God wants to take you to a deeper place with Him. Maybe you've been crying out in your life for a deeper intimacy with God. And He's bringing you to the place where we have to surrender more. I will tell you, there has been more times than not in my life that maybe something that was okay for me yesterday now is not okay because of where God wants to take me. And they're not necessarily showstopper issues. But maybe there's just some things that I've been permitting in my life where God wants to remove because it's distracting me from what He really wants to call me to. Maybe God has a divine purpose that you haven't seen fully yet. Maybe you've been crying out that God would experience your level of influence with your coworkers or whatever. Maybe you just need a greater anointing on your life. And I will tell you, when it's God initiated, when He begins to transition, hang on, baby. (laughs) And it's okay. You might have some tearing away. You might have some things that are painful to let go of. But I guarantee you, when you do on the other side of that thing, you will receive great reward and you will see your influence. And the anointing on your life will grow and grow. We saw this with John. John baptized, right? And he was, it was a baptism of repentance. But then John also indicated that there was one greater than him that was coming. And he would baptize with what? Holy Spirit and with fire. It was a transition that God wanted to bestow upon his people, upon his children, something greater. A gift from heaven. So let us pursue the greater. Amen? Let's pursue the greater and let's transition with expectancy and hope and joy in our hearts. Amen. I pray that we would just receive a baptism of God's joy, that it would just overflow from our lives. I tell you, it doesn't take long to have the dark cloud of culture come over you. But boy, the culture needs some joy, the joy of Jesus. And I pray that we, as the body of Christ, will let that internal joy flow out of us into the world around us. It's not something that can be produced from external circumstances. It comes from an inward work of the Holy Spirit in your life. Now, There's something that we all desire when we're going through transitions, and it's stability. 
It's something that we pursue. And stability has a source. Listen to this. Jesus is the source. Amen? Jesus is the source. He's our hope. He's our security to navigate life and the life to come. In the book of Nahum, chapter 1, verse 7, God is described as this. This is the heart of our Lord. He is good. Amen? He is a refuge. He is caring, and he is trustworthy. I don't know about you, but we could use some good, trustworthy uh, things in our lives. We could use some caring. We could have a place to run to, and that is the God that you and I serve. And as John pointed to Jesus, there was a lot in that statement that he made. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Today, we're going to take a little closer look at the concept of what it means to behold. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you that you bring us through the transitions of life. And as you do, God, you take us into greater places with you. It may not make sense to the world, but God, it makes sense to you and to your kingdom. So I pray that today you give us ears to hear, Father God, and hearts to receive your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So up until this moment on the banks of the Jordan, there was a lot of things that had been transpiring. The people had not received a word from the Lord for four years hundred years. From the book of the prophet Malachi, okay? If you go to the end of the book of Malachi, the last word in the book of Malachi is destruction. Encouraging, right? (laughs) For 400 years. Now let's put some perspective on that. The United States has been around for roughly 250 years. In our lifetimes, most of us in here, you know, we haven't lived that long. We've lived a fraction of that, and we think that our lifetimes are really something. But for 400 years, they are often referred to as the silent years, okay? All they had was the, the, the words of the Lord that they were standing on. The prophets were no longer speaking until John the Baptist came along, and John the Baptist had a message to prepare the hearts of the people, okay? Repent, okay? Turn back to God. There was obviously some things that had uh, needed reawakening in their lives, and John was the man. During this time, there was political, there was religious and social upheavals all over the place. They were on the rise, They had gone through a period of time where the Greeks were in control. They were now in a time when Rome had come in, and 63 B.C. is roughly when that happened, when they came in and they conquered and they took over. But the Greek influence initially in the culture had influenced it very negatively. It was worldly, humanistic, and it was ungodly. Does it sound familiar? When Rome came in, They conquered Israel, and they placed them under control of the Caesars. There was this idea of what was called syncretism, and syncretism was simply, you just keep adding on. So they were allowing them to worship, but then they also had to worship the Caesars and everything else that was going on. It was a very distorted culture. Now, one of the things that even in the the Jewish culture that was happening is there was these, these groups called the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And the Pharisees, what they were doing was literally adding to the law of Moses. They were placing legalistic traditions and demands upon the people and considered that their laws were actually more important than God's laws. If you turn to Mark chapter 7... In verse 8, Jesus was confronting this. I'll back up just a few verses. Verse 5, it says, So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, Why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. Verse 8, you have let go of the commands of God, and now you're hanging on to human traditions. So friends, it was even happening back then. 
Not everything that they were doing and practicing was lining up with the Word of God. And they, were, they, were, they, were, they may have had some personal convictions that they were exporting and trying to get everybody to do it their way. I think the Word of God is very clear, but we see the same things in culture happening even today. But this was happening. So there was frustration in culture. There was rampant frustration. And it was for both Jews and pagans. The culture had been poisoned. And the culture had begun to poison the truth even in the religious system. I always find it funny, and I, I've mentioned this scripture before. It's in Mark eight fourteen and 15. But Jesus gave a warning. And he said that there were two types of leaven to be careful of. He said, be careful of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And those are the two different systems, the religious system and the political system. And Jesus was exposing the heart of God, right? And he was saying, you know, you, you've gotten off track here. You're trying to heap all this stuff on people. You're making, you know, a, a, a mountain out of something that was never even in the Mosaic law. And you've made that into a law of your own and a tradition of your own. So with this frustration, Messiah, Messiah was the only hope that they held to. Messiah, the answer, the one that they'd heard about years ago. So the polytheistic culture was not providing the answers that they wanted. And even the monotheistic, the religious culture wasn't providing the answers. So they all knew that Messiah had to come. Amen? Messiah, Jesus had to show up on the scene. It was the only hope. So the stage was set and it was ready for his appearing. John's baptizing. He's bringing the message. He's being faithful. He's getting ready for the day of transition. And then Jesus come down. And here they see him on the banks of the Jordan. And the Holy Spirit came down upon Jesus and remained. And John had been spoken to by the Holy Spirit that when that happened, that was the individual. So that's a little background of what was happening. So now let's look at this word, behold. Behold. I asked several people, uh, just what, do you, what does that word mean to you? You know, and this was the consistent answer that I was getting. When, when, you, when you think of it in just our, you know, modern language, people is to gaze upon, to see, to observe, to look at, okay? To behold. But it carries so much weight with it that we don't really understand in our modern language. If you go and you look at the Greek words, um, it goes a little deeper. It's kind of like this. Hey, attention! Attention! Look! See here! See here! You need to consider this! You need to get this! You do not want to miss this. This is the one. This is Messiah. This is the one that I've been telling you about. This is the one that I've been baptizing for. This is the one. You do not want to miss this. Behold. A little different than a casual glance, isn't it? This is the Messiah. This is our deliverer. This is our Redeemer. This is the one who was and is and is to come. He is the one that we have been praying for and crying out for. He is the one that I have been reawakening your hearts toward. This is the one that the Holy Spirit is upon. This is the one that I have been baptizing for. This is the precious Lamb of God. So when we look at behold, behold carries with it so much more. Behold means to, 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 to get your heart ready to receive. Take notice. This is He. Secondly, 
John calls him the Lamb of God. He was the fulfillment of the final Passover Lamb. Amen? You can read about it in Exodus chapter 12. But what was happening is during uh, Israel's captivity in Egypt, all the plagues, and God, they had been crying out, and God sent them a deliverer, Moses and Aaron, and they had been confronting Pharaoh, right? And then the final plague was going to come. It was going to be the death angel. And they prepared a Passover. And Moses and Aaron, they instructed the people to go and get a, a lamb and to slaughter that lamb and to take a basin and collect the blood of that lamb. And then they took the blood of the lamb and they put it over the doorpost. They painted it on the doorpost. And that night when, the, when they were praying and seeking God and when that angel of death came into the camp to smite the firstborn in Egypt... Wherever the blood was applied, hallelujah, that death angel passed over. That was a type and a shadow of what was to come in Jesus Christ. So when, Jesus was, when John was referring to Jesus as the precious Lamb of God, this was the final Passover Lamb. This was the precious Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And friends, when He went to the cross, when He shed His blood for you and for me, wherever the blood is applied over the doorposts of our heart, hallelujah, the wages of sin of death, but the gift of God is eternal life, and the death sentence that was on us was paid for by the blood of Jesus, hallelujah. He was the fulfillment of the Passover lamb. It was no longer about a ritual. It was no longer about a strict set or adherence to rules. It wasn't that the rules were bad. It wasn't that the law was bad. It's just that it was unattainable for you and I. Jesus was the fulfillment because we could never do it in and of ourselves, friends. Amen. When did Jesus not become enough? It's Jesus. It's Him alone. It's not Jesus plus works. Your works are a product of the joy in your heart and the gratitude in your heart. I serve God not because I have to. I serve God because I want to. Yeah. Jesus was the pure Lamb of God that took our place. He was the substitutionary death and atonement for sin. Quickly, Romans chapter 3. Thank you, Lord. Everybody okay? Yeah. All right. Romans chapter 3, verse 21. It says, But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ. Where? Through faith in Jesus Christ. To all who believe. Everybody say all. All. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of His blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate His righteousness because in His forbearance He had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate His righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Jesus was our substitute. He's the substitutionary atonement. He was the only one and that is the case. That's what we rest upon. It's not your good works, friends, okay? It's Jesus and Jesus Christ alone. That takes some pressure off, doesn't it? And I'm going to tell you, it doesn't mean that we don't do good works. We do good works because we love Him, because we want to serve Him, because that's one of the ways that we show gratitude and thankfulness. Amen? But the motivation, okay, is different. So the Lamb of God is who Jesus was. So we behold. Take note, right? Pay attention. You need to get this. Don't miss this. This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 
So how does this look in my life? Here's the real transition. Thirdly, my life for his life. And John said this as we read last week. I must increase. He must increase. Or excuse me, I must decrease. He must increase. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to land this. To behold ultimately means that my life must translate. My life must translate into giving up my ways for His ways. It must translate. It can't, there's going to be an evidence of an internal change of something that happens with Jesus. It means that I don't just keep living the same way that I've always lived. And again, it's the harsh reality, friends, is sometimes I know people, they've said the prayer, but there's no change. There's no heart change. I'm not the judge of a man's heart. Only God is equipped to judge the thoughts and the intents of the heart. But I do believe that there will be some evidence. There'll be a tenderness towards God. There'll be some type of change that takes place. Oh my goodness, I remember the day that I got saved. I remember when I had the revelation that this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Can you put something on, please? I will tell you that this only comes one way. It only comes through repentance. It only comes through preparing the way for your heart to receive what God has for you. It comes through changing the way that I think about life. It means that I have to come to a place where I admit I was wrong. I had to come to a place in my life where I admitted, Jesus, I have been living for all the wrong reasons. I thought I was just having a good old time. But Lord, I was hurting your heart. I was sinning. And I needed a covering. And I felt bare in that moment. But in that moment, Jesus came and he wrapped his arms around me. And he picked me up and he held me and he embraced me. And I said, God, I know I'm not thinking right. I need you to help me. I need you to show me how to live my life. And when I repented, I remember the tears that flowed. I just couldn't stop. It was days and days and days. I had such deep regret. I had such heartache. And then the realization that I was actually promoting a message that was contrary to the one who bled and died for me and loved me even when I was in my mess. And I said, God, I'll give you everything I got. And I'm going to tell you, in my journey, I've made so many bonehead mistakes. I've been up, down, and all around. But I tell you right now, I'll never, ever, ever give up on that decision that I made for Him. Holy Spirit has brought me to places and depths in Him that I can't even explain sometimes. I can't even describe it sometimes. I don't have words to. But I know that I know that I know that I know my Redeemer lives. And He is interceding for me. And even when I mess up, even when I go the wrong way, He reaches out and He brings me back. God is so wonderful. But friends, we have to have the behold moment. We have to recognize that He's the Lamb of God. And we have to recognize that it's time for us as God's children to enter into the behold moment and count the cost. Because I will tell you, on the other side of that transition, there is incredible, incredible fruit and reward. Truth. If we say that we have no sin... We deceive ourselves. We've fallen into deception. And the truth is not in us. But if we just confess, He is faithful and He is just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You mean even the Yeah, even that. 
all those things that you think nobody knows about, whatever. <laughs> it's beautiful. Listen to this. Acts 3.19. Repent. <laughs> Don't we love that word? Repent! <laughs> Turn to God and your sins will be wiped out. Times of refreshing will come. Jeremiah 31.25 I will refresh the weary and I will satisfy the faint. Psalm 19.7 says that he will refresh the soul. Isaiah 40.31 <laughs> They that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up on wings like eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not faint. Hallelujah. Isaiah 58, 11, the Lord will provide you with water. <laughs> when you are dry, living water, restoring your strength. Now, I don't know about you. When I think about that, and I think about the trade-off, when I surrender in humility to the Lord, I get freedom from sin. I get a satisfied soul. I get refreshed. <laughs> I get strength. I get my thirst quenched. I get restoration and healing for my body, soul, and spirit, all parts of me. I think that's a pretty good trade-off, don't you? Yes. Amen. So as we're transitioning, in summary, behold, understand, there's so much more to that word. Behold the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God, the Messiah, the One. Okay? Culture wants to tell you there's all these different ways. That's the offense that culture has with Christianity is because it's, it's, it's exclusive. There's one mediator between God and man, and it's Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Behold the Lamb. Get this. Don't miss this. Jesus is the Messiah. Exchange my life for his life and experience great times of refreshing. Can we receive this from the Lord today? Amen? Amen. So, as we begin to explore this concept of beholding the Lord, we're going to look at things like worship. We're going to look at things like how we align our lives. Because truly, when you, under, when you align your life with God, or, or you know, with kingdom, God makes sense, Okay? If you're just aligning your life with culture, if you're living like I have many times where you got one foot in the world and one foot out, you're going to be a mess. But if you live anchored in God's Word, life all of a sudden makes sense. We're going to talk about stewardship. We're going to talk about how beholding the Lord. That means that I realign my life in areas of stewardship. It means that I do things God's way. I look, we're going to look at money, okay? Oh, I know I rarely talk about money. But we're going to look at it because I want you to receive the blessing of God on your finances. Gifts. Spiritual gifts. We're going to look at how sandwiched right in the middle of all those gifts, there's this great Corinthian chapter of 13 of love. And we're going to look how to live again. Living unveiled in the Lord. So I hope you're encouraged. I hope today you can behold the Lamb of God. Now, one of